Astronomers have detected thousands of worlds beyond our solar system, but despite decades of searching, we have never detected their magnetic films. Today, we might have found the first clue. Hello, I'm Dr. Jake Turner. And I'm Dr. Ryan MacDonald. We're research associates at Cornell University's Carl Sagan Institute. Today, we'll be discussing an exciting discovery that has just been announced, the first evidence of radio emission from an exoplanet. Hello and welcome to the first instalment of Carl Sagan Institute Conversations, a new series where scientists like ourselves discuss some of the latest discoveries by researchers at Cornell's Carl Sagan Institute. We're kicking off these conversations with an exciting result found by an international team led by Dr. Turner. So Jake, could you start by telling us a little bit about what you have found? Yeah, so in this study, we found the first hints of radio emission coming from a planet outside our solar system, a giant planet called Talbotes B. How does a, a planet itself naturally produce radio signals? We've known um, from our solar system that planets with magnetic fields, such as Jupiter, naturally emit radio waves. And what is going on is basically particles from the sun, electrons and protons, when they get caught in the magnetic field, they gyrate around the magnetic field lines and they create light. And then in the case of the planets, this light is in the radio. Same electrons that create the radio emission continue down and actually hit the atmosphere to create the beautiful auroras that we see in the optical and, and near UV. How long have we known that planets like Jupiter and Uranus emit in radio signals? The first indication from our solar system that Jupiter was naturally emitting radio waves was in the 1950s. We were able to actually discover that Earth had radio mission after we started sending satellites into space. Shortly after that, when we sent the Voyager probes, we were able to discover radio mission from Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So almost from the dawn of the space age, the, the moment that we were sending probes out in our own solar system, we started detecting the, these radio signals coming from uh, Jupiter, for example. So why then is it so challenging to detect radio emission from exoplanets? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically the most challenging things are the exoplanets are very far away. And so if we put Jupiter at an exoplanet distance, uh, we've known this basically since the 1950s, there's no way we can detect it. The signal is just too faint. So it wasn't until we discovered the first hot Jupiter um, in 1995 that we started realizing that we, maybe these planets would be better to search for a radio mission. And these planets are orbiting really close to their stars. They're orbiting at about a day or two. Because of that, they're really, you know, they're getting bombarded by a lot of electrons from the solar wind. The more electrons you have that are hitting the magnetospheres of the planets, the more radio light you will get. We're kind of using that same idea of what we learned in our solar system and applying that to these hot Jupiters. And if we do that, uh, you know, we believe that we should be able to, to actually detect these planets uh, with current radio uh, telescopes from, from Earth. So we, we've known that exoplanets exist since the 1990s now. Um, we've had ne nearly 30 years of exoplanet discoveries and almost every day we're discovering new planets and learning more about these distant worlds. So the idea of searching for radio emission from an exoplanet has been around for quite some time. Could you, could you give us an idea of how long people have been searching for radio emission from exoplanets? People have been looking basically since the 1970s, um, so that every radio telescope that comes out, people, you know, try to look for exoplanets either blindly, uh, when before we even knew them, or, you know, systematically now that we know them. So, like, we don't really know what frequency to look at, and we also don't know how bright they're going to be either. There have been a lot of theoretical predictions for the past 20 years, and so really observations are the, the best way we can constrain the, these models. On the observational front, then, uh, what what has changed? So could you tell us a little bit about which telescope did you use? So the telescope we use is called LOFAR. It's the Low Frequency Array. Parts of the telescope are located all across Europe, but we only use the core of the telescope in the Netherlands. And this is a state-of-the-art telescope, and it's one of the most sensitive low-frequency telescopes we know. Why is it now, after such a multi-decade long journey, that we're finally starting to see these radio signals? All the searches before actually were, you know, looking with sensitivities that were higher than the predictions. And so this is the first time that we had a study that actually had more sensitivity than the theoretical predictions. And also one thing that we did in this study that was very different than a, a lot of other studies 
is we try to observe most of the orbit of the planet as much as possible. The mission is not always pointed at Earth. It's actually beamed. So there's sometimes it's pointed at Earth, sometimes it's not. We believe that it, that is periodic. It's not always pointed at Earth. So some of these previous studies only look for a few hours, you know, at, at the planets or even at the stars that may or may not have planets around them. And they concluded they didn't see anything, but it could have been they just missed it or they were looking at the wrong frequency. So clearly the, these have been very challenging observations to make, and it's relied a lot on the technology and the facilities improving, but it must have also taken a huge amount of time to be able to search for something that no one has been able to successfully find before. So how long like, have you personally been working on the search for radio emission from exoplanets? So I've been working on this uh, since the third year of my PhD in 2015, so five years now. I've been interested in this field since the start of my career in, in university in 2007. So in 2007, I read a paper by my future PhD advisor who is on this paper that we recently published, uh, jean Matthias Gressemeyer. And this paper was a theory paper from his PhD. His paper said that in the 2010s, we should be able to use this new telescope LOFAR to search for radio emission from exoplanets with a sensitivity that's never been searched before. Uh, and so I read that paper as a freshman in college and I was just like really interested in it. And I was like, I wanna do this. I had no idea how I was gonna get involved in this research, but the journey was not very straight, but eventually I got there. This, this planet that you, you think you're seeing this radio signal from, and the one that is uh, in your background as well, uh, Tau Butis B, why did you choose this particular system to observe? And I know you looked at two other systems in your paper as well, but how did you know that this would be a good target? My PhD advisor, John Mateus Kressemeyer, he calculated basically what we could see from every exoplanet that was known. Um, so he took all the exoplanets that are known and he like put all their physical parameters into a calculation and, uh, you know, figured out what frequencies we can observe them at potentially and also what, how bright they would be. And this target turned out to be one of the best for that because it's really close to its host star. It's actually, it's also a really massive planet, a lot more massive than Jupiter. So people have definitely been thinking about this system for a while. What does this tell us about the planet itself? So assuming the, the radio emission is real and coming from the planet, the first thing it tells us is that the planet has a magnetic field. And it also, and from the frequency of that emission that we observe, we can figure out what the strength of that magnetic field is. So that's a, that's a really a crucial step. And so from that, we can actually figure stuff about the interior structure of the planet. When we first discovered the radio emission from Jupiter, we were actually able to figure out what was going on in the interior of, of Jupiter before we sent probes there. I think it's absolutely incredible that what we are potentially seeing here is in an exoplanet, which is 50 light years away from Earth, electrons are spiraling around in a magnetic field and producing radio signals that we can detect at Earth, which is pretty phenomenal. So you, you mentioned, Jake, that you can use this measurement of the magnetic field to say something about what's going on inside of the planet. What specifically about the inside of a giant planet can we learn from measuring its magnetic field? You know that it has to have a, a dynamo, basically. So there has to be some kind of metal that is creating the magnetic field in the first place. In the case of Earth, that's, you know, an iron liquid core. In the case of Jupiter, that is metallic hydrogen. We, we haven't done these calculations, but uh, obviously someone will, but it will tell us something that we don't know otherwise. We also believe that it affects the atmosphere of the planet as well. So there could be magnetic effects in the atmosphere that changes how the winds move, for example, and even how the atmosphere evolves. Like does it lose its atmosphere over time and will it survive or will it not have an atmosphere after millions and billions of years? So now that we know that it is possible in principle to detect radio emission from exoplanets, what comes next? Right, that's a great question. So the first thing is we want to confirm this detection of Taubu uh, in the radio. So we're, we have a, a large campaign that we've started on multiple telescopes ar around the world to try to confirm the signal. And then after that, we're planning to do a survey with this telescope in France called Nenufar. And we're planning on surveying, you know, tens to 20 planets to try to look for their radio mission. And we're going to be looking at the entire orbit of the planet. And so we can actually see this beamed emission and, it, and this telescope is actually more sensitive than, than LOFAR. So in this survey that you're thinking of, looking at many, many more planets potentially uh, searching for radio signals, I'm presuming that most of those are close in giant planets, right? That is correct. Yeah, most of them are really massive planets. So how challenging would it be 
to detect radio emission from rocky Earth-like planets in their habitable zone that we want to learn much more about in our field in the search to understand uh, the, the habitability of our universe. Yeah, well, it's going to be very tricky. So the first thing is we can't observe this from the ground because frequencies that are lower than 10 megahertz cannot be observed from the ground. That's because of the, the ionosphere of the Earth kind of like blocking the radio signals. We have to go to space. So we either have to have a spacecraft or we have to have a moon array telescope, which actually most people are preferring a lunar array telescope because you can put it on the far side of the moon and you can actually block out all of the radio emission that humans are creating that interfere with our detections. So if we were to detect radio emission from an Earth-like exoplanet, what would that actually tell us about the planet? We believe that it might tell us something about the habitability of the planet, basically. So we know from our solar system that the magnetic field of Earth helps protect our atmosphere from being stripped away by the sun. And we've actually been able to detect on Mars, which doesn't have a magnetic field currently, its atmosphere being stripped away. We believe that the magnetic field of an Earth-like planet will help retain its atmosphere over a long period of time that could make it more habitable. That vision that you presented there is absolutely fascinating and thank you for sharing it with us, Jake, about how we're just now using telescopes on the ground to learn about the magnetic fields of planets around other stars and that one day, hopefully not in the too distant future, we can imagine building giant arrays on our own moon to search for the magnetic fields and the associated radio emission from rocky planets in the habitable zones of their stars. Thank you very much, Jake, for joining us in this first installment of the Carl Sagan Institute Conversations. Thank you for having me. If you do have any questions about magnetic fields and exoplanets or radio emission coming from these distant worlds for Dr. Turner, by all means, please do drop them down below and we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, please do also let us know your thoughts on this format. And we hope to see you again in the near future for the next installment of the Carl Sagan Institute Conversations. Bye for now.